Hey friends, my name is Camden Pulliam. I wanna welcome you to this week's version of Ask the Experts. Uh, this week we have Dr. Owen Strand, who is our expert in biblical theology, systematic theology, and even public theology. Uh, we're excited to hear Dr. Strand answer perhaps the most important question in human history. Who is Jesus? Um, not only is Dr. Strand a beloved member of our faculty, but he was my supervisor in my doctoral dissertation. So I'm particularly interested in hearing Dr. Strand and Dr. Strand on this question. Um, here in just a moment, I'm gonna hand it over to him to lecture for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll be able to take your questions on the back end. So as you're listening to Dr. Strand, be sending in your questions on the Q&A uh, part of the Zoom. Uh, with that, I'd love to pray for you, Dr. Strand, and then hand it over to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, not to condemn us, but to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sin, from our shame, from our guilt, and from the suffering that's caused from all of those things. God, we thank you for Jesus, and we're excited to hear more about who he is and what he's done. I pray for Dr. Strand that you would um, lead him uh, to speak wisely and truthfully to our listeners today. Thank you for this time. We ask your blessing on it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Camden. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Current students, future students, thinking about being students. It's a joy to have you today. And this is quite a topic, as Camden alluded to. This is really the question of questions. Who is Jesus? Several decades ago, a series of quests for the historical Jesus emerged. This began with Ernest Caseman and then continued down to what has been recently called the Jesus Seminar. This group of academics in the Jesus Seminar attempted to discover the historical Jesus from out of the Gospels and other biblical materials. And in the course of the proceedings of the Jesus Seminar, these experts sought to determine which sayings of Jesus are authentic in the New Testament. So the participants in the seminar, again, all of them academics and uh, experts in the New Testament, voted with colored beads. A red bead indicated that the saying from the Gospels was an authentic saying of Jesus himself. Pink indicated that a saying was possibly said by Jesus. Gray indicated serious doubt about one of the sayings of Jesus from the Gospels. And then black was used to signal that a saying was surely not an authentic statement of Jesus. In 1993, the Jesus Seminar released their version of the New Testament Gospels using this color-coded system that I just gave you. The seminar voted that only 18% of the sayings recorded in the New Testament from Jesus are either true or probably true. 18%. If you wanted to put it simply, the red letter version of the Gospels from the Jesus Seminar includes very little red. This was an interesting touch point for thinking about Jesus in Western society and culture. In decades past, centuries past, generations past, it would have been taken for granted that if you're reading the Gospels, you're reading authentic sayings of Jesus Christ. But in recent generations, that's very much up for grabs and up for debate. Rudolf Bultmann, influential New Testament scholar from the 20th century, famously said this about the New Testament and its, its world. Quote, it is impossible to use electric light and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries, and at the same time, believe in the New Testament world of demons and spirits. Marcus Borg, who was lined up with the Jesus Seminar, said this about the resurrection. I think the resurrection of Jesus really happened, but I have no idea if it involves anything happening to his course, corpse, and therefore I have no idea whether it involves an empty tomb, he continued. So I would have no problem whatsoever with archeologists finding the corpse, the body of Jesus. For me, that would not be a discrediting of the Christian faith or the Christian tradition. Now, this is obviously unbiblical material. Many people, frankly, do not believe in Jesus. You can even have a PhD in New Testament or systematic theology and, and go through a five-year range of coursework, do it all, and do it all while not believing that Jesus is actually the Son of God. Many people have that perspective. They doubt Jesus, they distrust him. But here's the other end of the spectrum. Many people do believe in Jesus, at least they say so, but they believe in a Jesus of their own making. 
The Apostle Paul told us to expect this in 2 Corinthians 11, 4. If someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. What Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 11, 4 for our purposes is that we should expect that there are going to be other Jesuses, another Christ, other versions of the gospel. Here are some other Jesuses we hear about today. Again, from people who say they believe in Jesus, not where the Jesus seminar is, basically disbelieving at least in a lot of what Jesus says about himself or says to others. This side does believe in Jesus, but they give us, I think, another Jesus. Life coach Jesus just wants to give you a more fulfilled existence. There's different informal versions of what I'm calling life coach Jesus, but basically Jesus is there, as it used to be said from Arnold Schwarzenegger, to pump you up, to give you a more fulfilled existence. You're, you're leading this kind of down in the mouth existence and you need to just rev it up. And Jesus is here to walk by your side, and that's the, that's the goal he's after. Best life now, Jesus wants to give you everything you've ever wanted. So all the material possessions, all the accolades, all the influence you could ever desire, that's what Jesus is after. He wants you to be living your best temporal life now. Activist Jesus is another figure of Jesus that we hear about today, where he's the ultimate community organizer who is here to change the political order. That's what he came for. He came to liberate people. He came to make this world a more equitable place. Jesus is an activist, and he's come to summon us to follow him in that mission. Juice Cleanse Jesus wants you to be healthier, fitter, and more positive in your life. If you'll just follow Jesus, you'll be a healthier version of yourself. And finally, athletic performance Jesus desires that you reach peak performance in your endeavors, maybe write a verse on your sneakers, something like this. Jesus is really about you exceeding and excelling in the public arena, perhaps in sports. These are all informal versions of Jesus that we hear, but it's actually important not only to identify the Jesus of the Jesus seminar, who's not really the biblical Jesus at all, and also the informal versions of Jesus that we hear about. Together, these are collectively distortions of Jesus. Some directly don't believe in Jesus. They disbelieve, flat out. Others follow what we could call believing unbelief. They say they believe in Jesus, but if you don't believe in the true biblical Jesus, do you actually believe in Jesus? You see, friends, this is part of what we do at a seminary like this. This is part of what we do in seminary classrooms on Christ. We teach our students that it's not enough for people to simply say, I follow Jesus. I believe Jesus. I read the Bible. What is actually behind that claim matters tremendously. In fact, to sharpen the point, there's eternity baked into that statement. There's either eternal heaven or, or eternal existence with God or eternal hell. Those are the stakes. The stakes are impossibly high here. Uh, believing in the wrong Jesus means that we do not know Jesus and we will suffer the wrath of God for all eternity. So the stakes are not low here. Again, they are very serious indeed. This is the question of questions alongside the doctrine of God more broadly. Who is Jesus? Herman Bovink about 100 years ago said this about Christ. The doctrine of Christ is not the starting point, but is certainly the central point of the whole system of dogmatics, of theology. All other dogmas or doctrines either prepare for it or are inferred from it. So this is the greatest theologian of the 20th century Dutch tradition in a systematic sense telling us that the doctrine of Jesus Christ the identity of Jesus Christ, in other words, is the central point of Christian theology. This really is the central question we have to answer as Christians. Because God, the Father, has put forward his Son in order that we would know God truly only through Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that no less than all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. There's a lot of promises of God in the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, the Apostle Paul is saying to us that all of them are yes in Christ, 
but only in Christ. There's a lot on Jesus' shoulders, in other words. There, there's a lot that the Bible itself is telling us about this unique person. The Bible hangs everything on Jesus, not a lot on Jesus. Everything hinges on this man, on who he is, on his person and his work. Everything depends on how you understand him. Your ministry, any ministry that you enter into in days ahead, all hinges on Jesus, on your understanding of Jesus, specifically on whether you know the biblical Jesus and teach him and proclaim him or not. Well, hopefully we've laid out the stakes, and now you see, as I'm sure you do, that the stakes on this question are very high. What I want to do in our brief, brief time remaining is give you eight truths about Jesus that put all this together. There's so much more to say about him, but here are eight that I think we need to say from the Word of God, the Word of God being our authority, the Word of God being sufficient to teach us all Christian doctrine that we need to know about Jesus. There's nothing outside of, of the Bible that we need to know about Jesus. The, the Word of God gives us everything we need for life and godliness in pursuing King Jesus. So let's do it. Let's, let's get going. First, first truth about Jesus. Jesus is the last Word of God and the obedient servant of God. The last Word of God and the obedient servant of God. This is what Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Here we are learning that the Father has spoken to us by the Son. This is the final word of God given to us, given to humanity. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity who has taken on flesh for us and for our salvation. So in technical terms, there has always been the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who we know through the scripture as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead taking on human flesh for us, living fully God, fully human, in order that we would know God. Jesus then needs to be understood as a real human person, but not as uh, a person uh, who, who we can explain outside of scriptural terms. Jesus is, is truly God and truly human. He's the son of God. He's the last word of God. In other words, this is the one Hebrews 1 is saying that we must look to if we are to know God. And Jesus is the obedient servant of God. The father has appointed Jesus, the heir of all things. The father has sent the son. Jesus says in John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. The stress in that text, John 4, 34, is on Jesus not doing his will, but doing the Father's will, and not accomplishing Jesus' work, but accomplishing the Father's work that the Father has given the Son to do. So Jesus, we can sum that up in saying, is the obedient servant of the Father. He is the divine servant of of the Father. The Father is his head, 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. I believe that means the Father is eternally the head of Christ. And that tells us then that the Son is obeying the Father in coming, a truth that is realized in what we call the economy of God's work, but is already anchored uh, well before Jesus ever comes to earth. The Father is the head of his Son, even as that takes shape in the redemptive mission and work of of Jesus. So Jesus is the last word of God, the obedient servant. Wow, what does that tell us about obedience? It tells us that if Jesus came to do the will of the Father, to obey the Father, then we who follow Jesus need to have a very strong category for obedience in our Christian faith. If Jesus obeys the Father, those of us who follow Jesus need to obey the Father and see that as a crucial part of our life, our work, our mission. Second, Jesus is the new temple. In the Old Testament, the Israelites build a temple for the worship of God, but when Jesus comes, he says in John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then verse 21 says he was speaking about the temple of his body. John 2 is telling us that Jesus is the center 
of worship of God. No longer do you and I need to identify a building on planet earth and, and that's the place we go. Oh look, this is where we find Jesus. We find Jesus through faith and being in Jesus through justifying faith means that we have come to the site of the worship of God. There, there's not a physical location then that you have to identify on Google Maps and go worship God there. And if you don't go there, mm, sorry, you're not worshiping God. Anyone who worships Jesus, the true Savior as lined out by the word of God, has come to God, has come to the one who shows us God, has come to the proper site of worship. This is really encouraging as well. It's hard to not apply these truths as we go through this material because this reminds us that though we value gathering with the church body wherever we attend, whatever church we belong to, the church isn't a place, uh, the church is a, is a gathered body of, of believers, their God is with us. But even if somebody takes away our building, even if we can't meet in our building, let's say, we are not barred from the sight of God's worship. The sight where God would be worshiped is Jesus Christ. All who have faith in Jesus Christ have come to the acceptable place. Third, third glorious truth about Jesus. He's the great high priest. He's the great high priest. We learn this in, uh, in Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. We know that there are Old Testament priests who offer sacrifices to God such that the people can go before God and be forgiven provisionally of their sins in God's presence. But Jesus is the great high priest. He's the one who comes to fulfill the Old Testament priesthood. Hebrews 7, 26 says this, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus brings the sacrificial system of the Old Testament to its peak, to its fulfillment, to its conclusion, because he is the one who is fundamentally from the heavens. He is the one who is divine and then takes on a human nature, takes on flesh in order to atone for us. Jesus had to be divine in order to make forgiveness for sins, offer forgiveness for sins, and Jesus had to be human to stand in in our place for us, and that is exactly what Hebrews teaches us about Jesus, the great high priest. It's not just that he presides over the great sacrifice for sin, it's that he is the sacrifice for sin. It's that the, the high priest offers himself in our place. This is how we understand just how costly it was for Jesus to leave uh, eternity with God the Father, God the Spirit, come to earth, come into our mess, come into our chaos, and make atonement for us. Jesus is the great high priest. Look, there is nothing more for you to do to save yourself. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. In our unbelief, we think there is. We think that if we lead a virtuous life, or we join up with this cause, or we do these religious things, or we read these books, then we will either save ourselves or help to save ourselves, make ourselves more savable. There's nothing you can do to make yourself savable. The only thing you can do is cast yourself upon the mercies of God who has given us Jesus. And Jesus means, his acceptable sacrifice means that there is nothing that can be done to unsave us. Once you are saved, you are saved. God has you and the blood of the great high priest, the divine high priest, the God man, washes us perfectly clean. Fourth, Jesus is the one who remakes Israel. There is a true Israel that has been remade, to use a fancy theological term, reconstituted in Jesus. Paul says this in Romans 9. He says that not all descended from Israel belong to Israel. So there is a, there's a non-national Israel, Romans 9, 6, that is what we could call a true Israel. The true people of God, in other words, are found in Jesus. If you're looking for the people of God on earth, where are they? Are, are they a nationality? Is there a country to which they belong? Do I need a certain passport or citizenship in order to belong to the people of God? You belong to the true people of God when you belong to Jesus Christ by faith and repentance in his name. So Jesus has made a new people for himself 
one new man, Ephesians 2.15 says, by his blood, by his atoning sacrifice, Jesus has reconstituted the people of God. And that means that anyone who was washed in the blood of the lamb is our brother, our sister, in the faith. That means that background, ethnicity, class, educational status is not our ultimate identifier or, or marker of personal identity. Our ultimate marker is that we are found in Jesus Christ, and that is the true family of God and the true people of God today. That's how strong the cross of Christ working together with the resurrection of Christ is it actually makes a new humanity to which all who are in Christ belong. Fifth, Jesus is the new law and the true human. He's the new law and the true human. He's the new law in that when he comes, he brings the new covenant, the new covenant teaching and the new covenant that is ultimately cut by his blood. He says in John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. It's not that he burns up the Old Testament, the Old Testament law or any of the Old Testament and says, well, this is useless. I've come to teach. Isn't that how human teachers operate often? My teaching is valuable, no one else's is. That's not actually what Jesus is technically teaching in his ministry. It is, however, that he brings the old covenant law and all the promises of God to perfect fulfillment, such that you and I are not bound by the old covenant law any longer. There's not a tripart distinction of, of the old covenant law, moral, civil, and ceremonial, that is explicitly taught in scripture. Some of our friends will argue for that, and we have those conversations on a seminary campus like this. But there's no such tripartite distinction in the Bible itself. Instead, Jesus brings the entire Old Covenant, Old Testament law to perfect fulfillment, and that means that you and I are not bound any longer to the Old Testament law. It's not because it's bad, it's just that Jesus is so impossibly good. He's the one the Old Testament was waiting for. He's the one in whom all the promises of God find fulfillment. And as a result of this, it is appropriate to say that Jesus is the fulfillment not only of the law, but of humanity itself. He's the second Adam. He's the one who comes to do what the first Adam did not do. Adam is made in God's image. Adam is fully God's image, just as every human person is fully an image bearer of God. But Jesus alone is truly the image of God. Jesus alone shows us what it means to be human. Jesus shows us, friends, that to be human is not to give in to your strongest passions and desires. To be human is not to choose an identity for yourself that you most like. To be truly human is to follow God, worship God, obey God in the fullness of your heart, your mind, and your soul. That's what it means to be truly human. So when we are saved in the name of Jesus Christ, the true human, you and I then are initiated into a life of true humanity. We're being changed from one degree of glory to another into the very image of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Sixth truth, Jesus is the focal point of history. Everything bends on Jesus. Matthew 5, 17 quotes Jesus as saying, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So again, here's this point that keeps cropping up in different places. Uh, the concept of fulfillment, of Christic fulfillment, is so important for us theologically and biblically. Jesus is the fulfillment of history. Jesus is the focal point of all human existence. Everything exists not for us, the way we think naturally in selfish terms. Everything exists for Jesus. The Father has put forward Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. All of this. All of your surroundings, wherever you are watching this right now, is not ultimately for you. It's ultimately for Christ. Christ has claimed it all. Christ is going to come back and he's going to make all things new to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the focal point of history. No other person can make that claim legitimately. Seventh, Jesus is the warrior king. He is the warrior king. He inaugurates a kingdom in his blood. Along these lines, very important uh, biblical theological theme, in other words, a theme that you trace 
from Old to New Testament. Jesus is David's greater son. Matthew 1.1, the first title Matthew gives us in his huge gospel is Jesus Christ, the son of David. Matthew is telling us something powerful with that title. That's not just a genealogical principle. It is that Jesus is coming in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7. Jesus is coming to be the greater David. David faces off against Goliath and saves the people of God. Jesus is the much, much greater David who has come to face down the much greater Goliath, Satan, and destroy the works of the prince of darkness. Jesus is a warrior king. He doesn't look that way. Don't miss that. He looks like a normal individual. And it looks like even when he's dying on the cross for our sins, penal substitutionary atonement as we call it, it looks like he's just a lamb. It looks like he's just come to offer himself as a sacrifice. To be very sure, <laughs> he has come as the lamb, as the one to be slain for your sin and mine. But Jesus in dying is making atonement is washing clean his people, is drinking the cup of the Father's wrath, and in so doing, is triumphing over the devil. In other words, he's winning back his people. He's washing them clean. The victory of the kingdom of Jesus is that his people are blood washed. It's that Satan cannot claim them. He has no legitimate claim on them. He has no hold over them because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed us clean, has purchased our redemption, and therefore Satan has no rights over us. We are gods by virtue of the lamb who is the lion, the lion who is the lamb. But make no mistake, that's part one. Part two of Jesus is that he is coming back in unmistakable form as a warrior king. He was one in his incarnation. It was veiled though. But he will be the warrior king with every eye seeing him as exactly that in his second coming. Revelation 19.11 tells us this directly. I saw heaven open, John writes, and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Now that version, vision of Jesus isn't super popular today. People are much more comfortable outside of the church, sometimes even inside of the church, with a kind of uh, tender Jesus who only comes alongside us to offer comfort and love and acceptance. That's not necessarily wrong about Jesus. Jesus offers us blood forgiveness. Jesus offers us the most tender mercies there are by his blood. But alongside that theme has to be brought this secondary one, the second one, not secondary, the second one that I'm introducing, that Jesus is the king, that Jesus makes war. And just because it doesn't look like Jesus is making war does not mean that he is failing to do so. He made war on the devil in his first coming, and he will complete his victory over the devil, inaugurated at the cross through the resurrection when he returns. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the hero you crave. Jesus is the strong one who will make every wrong right. Y you have been wronged. You have had sin done against you. The world cries out for justice. It's not that we're fundamentally victims because of Adam's fall. In fact, we're criminals with Adam in his fall. So we're not fundamentally victims and don't buy any theology or any line of thinking that casts you inherently as a victim. You and I are criminals committing the original sin that Adam and Eve prosecute in the garden. But make no mistake, Jesus has come to make all things right and Jesus is the judge of all the earth and Jesus is the strong warrior king that you and I crave. Every human heart naturally craves this kind of hero, this kind of deliverer. Well, we only crave heroes and kings and warriors because of Jesus. Sep uh, eighth and finally, excuse me, eighth and finally, Jesus is our eternal hope. He's our eternal hope. The only reason you and I have any degree of hope today is because of Jesus. It's not because of you. It's not because of me. It's not because of our pastor. It's not because of our spouse. It's not because of our kids. 
It's not because of our church. It's not because of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's not because of anything in the world of men. You and I have hope because Jesus Christ has come and has laid down his life for sinners like us and has been raised to life and is now at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is divine. Jesus is the one who has made atonement for sin. And thusly, because of that, Jesus is our eternal hope. He is the rest we seek. He, he is the one who, who guarantees that we will make it home. Jesus is our promised land. Jesus is our eternal rest. Friends, Jesus Christ is real. It is not only 18% of the gospel sayings that Jesus said. Hear me very clearly at Midwestern Seminary, without apology, without fear, declaring this to you. All the gospels tell us of Jesus. All the sayings of Jesus in the Bible are true. They are all for us. All that the New Testament teaches us about Jesus is true. All of it is authoritative. And we have banked all of our faith as Christians on all of Jesus. And all of us who are in Jesus will make it all the way to glory. God bless you. Dr. Strand, thank you so much for... Um yeah, giving us those eight points of who Jesus is. Uh, I'm encouraged just thinking about the fact that he is our only hope. If we put our hope in any other man, any other system, we're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. And so I'm, I'm encouraged just listening. Um, we've got questions here from you all. Thank you for submitting them. Um, we've got a little bit of time, 20, 25 minutes here to, to take questions. So I want to get to those. Uh, the first question here is a good one. You mentioned other Jesuses, false Jesuses, false Christ. Here's the question. In conversations with others, how do you attempt to get behind the assumptions or presuppositions in someone's statement saying, I believe in Jesus, in order to determine whether it is the true Jesus or a false Christ that they're actually believing in? Good question. Uh, I want to hear them talk. You know, here you've listened to me talk. Uh, theologians talk for a living, <laughs> as pastors do. But I want to hear what they say. I want to hear how they're framing Jesus. I want to hear what sources they cite. Um, I want to know whether they're depending upon Scripture. But even there, tons of people who do not know the true Jesus read the Scripture, cite the Scripture. Man, they even have a ministry ordered around, in some form, the Scripture. So what you have to do, there's no shortcut. There's no, uh, there's no button you press to do this. You just have to listen to them. Um, you, have to, you have to ask pointed questions about whether they affirm the humanity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, uh, Jesus not as a third thing, as this sort of different creature, but actually Jesus as the true human because he is the divine son of God in human form. Um, so, so Jesus isn't something different from us. Jesus actually is the embodiment of humanity. Uh, you, you're listening for all these sorts of things. You're listening for uh, whether they understand not only the person of Jesus, but the work of Jesus. Do they understand that he didn't come just to sort of walk on the earth and talk a lot, but he came to make atonement for sin? Um, so you want to hear all these sorts of things and more. But doing so means listening to people talk, not without interruption at any point, not without cessation, but getting them to voice their convictions and then engaging those, asking questions that follow. N never be scared of hearing where people you're discussing uh, are. Mm. You want to hear where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, a, that's a good thing. Which requires that you have quite a breadth of knowledge yourself to be able to hear something and say, well, let me, let me ask a clarifying question. So that's part of why we exist at Midwestern is to kind of fill in those gaps so we can listen carefully. That's good. That's right. Um, is there a particular scholar, scholarly author you would recommend who explores the personhood and deity of Christ within the New Testament specifically? Um, wow, there, there are several. Um, I probably would recommend to somebody who's got an appetite for theology and, uh, and some deeper reading, uh, Steve Wellam's book, God the Son Incarnate. Um, that is a, a really rich uh, book. I'd also recommend Bruce Ware's The Man Christ Jesus, um, a little more accessible, but also very theologically rich. Um, B.B. Warfield has written on the Savior in a, in a bunch of different writings, but one he's most famous for is The Emotional Life uh, of Our Lord, uh, 
I, I'm paraphrasing slightly there, but he's another thinker that I would commend uh, to readers. Um, those, are, those are at least a few That's to right. get folks started. Wellam, Ware, and in, in citing those voices, we're not saying, by the way, that only um, modern authors mm -hmm. are those that we should read. We are saying, though, that more recent authors are building off of um, the scripture fundamentally, uh, because that is our authority, but then they're in conversation with the church over the centuries, even over a millennia, uh, to figure out some of the tough questions um, about Jesus. So, so we're not saying only read modern sources, but we are saying, look, modern authors try to build off the, the whole church's wisdom mm. as it's uh, engaged scripture. Um, so that's, that's a, a word to note as well. Those are great. That was great. Okay, so this is a loaded set of questions. This is oh. not one question, this is a lot of questions. So I'll let you go where you want with oh, it. Wow. What are the consequences of false doctrines, such as Pentecostal or charismatic denominations, which by and large give an accurate gospel as related to salvation, but seem to misappropriate many things uh, to the Holy Spirit? They get Jesus right, in at least the big way, but get a lot wrong. Can we partner with these denominations? Will the adherents of these adherents of these denominations face discipline? Lots of questions there. Uh, that is a absolutely massive question and a good one or a set of questions. Um, what I would say is, it all depends on what group you're talking about. Honestly, that's not a dodge, but you're going to have to isolate different groups. Or if you have several groups in mind, if, if I'm talking with this individual, I'm going to want to know who they've been engaging. Um, uh, uh, let's just narrow in, as I set it up here, just for the purposes of time. Um, a charismatic tradition that would believe that we need to be cleansed by God um, of our sin, that Jesus dies in our place, that he, he suffers the wrath of God on the cross. Okay, so that's a, that's a biblical understanding of the work of Christ, for example. But then goes on to argue that in the atonement, through the atonement, we are healed. For example, our physical problems are healed as well. Is not necessarily, in my view, um, in heretical territory, but they're in dangerous territory. And depending on how far that is taken, as if, oh, if you get saved, everything you have will be healed physically, mm -hmm. it can it can get into another Christ quickly, can't it? Yeah. So we're trying, to, we're trying to be balanced here, and we try to be balanced at a school like this, and I try to be balanced in my systematic theology classes. I don't want to indicate that anybody who would have a slightly um, uh, different view than me is not a born-again believer, but I also want to recognize that even if somebody affirms the biblical gospel, the biblical atonement, if you add to that or subtract from that, you're immediately in jeopardy. That's right. You're immediately in trouble. And I can't offer you comfort. Yeah. Um, I, I, you may not technically be out of the kingdom, mm -hmm. so to speak, but you need to watch yourself very carefully. And the stakes are very high. That's why I quoted 2 Corinthians 11, 4 earlier, yeah. because it's very easy to start out uh, claiming the biblical Jesus, but end up if you deviate with another Jesus. It's a terrifying thought for us. Yeah because we all go astray. None of us is perfect. Uh, none of us reads the Bible perfectly. Um, so we just have to constantly be striving to be as, as melded to the scripture as, as we can. And we're gonna recognize that there are a lot of groups out there that claim the power of Jesus, for example, to heal or to, to give um, uh, uh, certain experiences that are at the very least in dangerous theological territory. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. I even think of doctrines that proclaim the, you know, baptismal regeneration or yes. a second washing of the Holy Spirit. And I loved how you said it, any addition or subtraction from Christ. Whereas if you're adding to the work of Christ, you're actually subtracting from it. That's, that's right. um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, this is a great question, just kind of a generic question. What advice do you have for someone who's beginning seminary online? Okay. This is, this is yeah. separated from the, the work of Christ, but okay. perhaps it could even tie in. I had my phasers set to stun <laughs> on doctrine of Christ, yes. so I was waiting. For, uh, no, that's a great question. Um, I want this person, any of our seminarians, to be um, strongly plugged into a local church, join your local church, become a member of your local church, and then find ways to serve it. Um, I want you to squeeze the orange of your Midwestern education, whether it's residential or online. So get as much of 
uh, get as much as you can out of it. I also would encourage seminarians, this isn't so much like directly lifted from the pages of scripture, but don't be afraid of, of hard work and humble service in the church, in ministry, but also even beyond it. Um, do, do, I think it's a really good thing for seminarians to get a tough job and actually persevere in it. A lot of us in our seminary years, our MDiv years, for example, had to, had to kind of gut it out. And you feel kind of bad about that. You, there, there can be like this sense of if I was really cutting it in the kingdom, I would have a ministry job at age 21 and a half or something. Well, maybe you would, but maybe that's, that's not the circumstance. So don't be afraid of having a tough grind it out job. I think it's actually a really good thing for, for seminarians to not um, be in uh, a Christian community. It's no bad thing to work at a church. It's a wonderful thing. But I just am trying to say on the other side, it's no, it's no bad thing to have a secular job, so-called. Be around unbelievers. Learn to talk to people who don't agree with everything you agree with. Um, learn to be in an environment where you, you can debate and dialogue without your head exploding at any given instance if somebody deviates from your belief slightly. Uh, so there's, look, this isn't, th there's a ton of things to say about doing your reading and writing the best papers you can and being in the Word of God, being, having a strong devotional life. Um, so, so that all matters tremendously. I'm just trying to say some extra things that we might not hear. I'll just say this in, in closing. Make sure fundamentally, whatever job you have, <laughs> however you pay the bills, that you are doggedly in the word of God and in prayer. Um, th this is especially a confusing time, the 21st century, 2021. Social media's influence is so strong. Uh, different voices in our culture are so loud. There's so much chaos and confusion today, all the more vital for you and me, not in a works-driven way, not in a legalistic way, but in just a hungry for God way to get in the word. And, and if you have those days where frankly, you don't feel like it, just remember that your faith is not feelings led and it's not feelings driven. There are plenty of days for all of us when our feelings are not where they, where they should be, exactly right. frankly. We have to repent of that. But then we, we get into the word anyway, and we, and we here's my metaphor again. I, I must really want orange juice right now, but we <laughs> squeeze the orange of God's word and, and, and get everything we can out of it. I love that. That's great. Okay, so the doctrine of Christ, I've always, often thought it feels like uranium, that it has the power to, to drive a whole country, but it also, if you touch it the wrong way, it can just go wrong really quickly. Yeah. So for seminarians, for people who are getting into the doctrine of Christ, uh, you know, throughout history, there have been so many um, heresies sur surrounding the, the doctrine of Christ. How would you suggest or recommend they get studied into the doctrine of Christ and, and get started on that study? Yeah, well, the books I mentioned earlier will help with that. Um, Wellam's book, God the Son Incarnate, for example, walks through uh, the major heresies. So that is a great place uh, to go. Um, that's really what I would say. Uh, at the at the at the first in terms of a theological resource. There's also though, there's never going to be a substitute for the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So we we're not championing a, a Bible only uh, uh, faith here, though that's certainly <laughs> a, a fine thing. If all you ever had to read was the Bible, you're getting to heaven. You know, if God gives you justifying faith. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are saying that um, yes, read as much as you can. Uh, be be voracious theologically. Uh, even read widely. But just know that there's, there's no substitute for, uh, for the word of God in knowing the doctrine of Christ. The, the scripture teaches you the doctrine of Christ. It doesn't teach it to you in a kind of encyclopedia way, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it teaches it to you. Yeah. So there's no substitute for it. And when you're in it, you're going you're gonna to pick up uh, the leanings of different, different heresies from church history. So you're going you're gonna to sense where, wait a minute, okay, I don't know everything about where this person is coming from, but it sounds like they don't think that Jesus assumed my humanity, okay? Um, not that he, is, he was a sinner, uh, uh, but, uh, but he assumed real human flesh, right? We, we affirm. Or you're going to pick up, okay, wait a minute. This movement is, is talking about Jesus as, as God's son, but they believe, like Bethel, for example, in California, believes that he essentially laid down his divinity in his earthly life. Um, well, that's a humongous problem 
uh, you don't have a biblical Christ at that point, honestly. So, so you may not know where somebody's coming from, but the more you're in the word of God, and then yes, you are reading sound theology, you're gonna be picking up um, that even people who say they love Jesus, even people who sing passionately about Jesus, throw their hands in the air or whatever, uh, even people who give up their existing job to go to a school and, and study about Jesus, you can do all of that and not know the true Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And that sounds tough today, uh, but that's, that's nothing other than what the New Testament plainly teaches. So. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I wanna bounce off of that. If Jesus was truly human, had, um, had true humanity, but didn't lay aside his divinity. How do, we, how do we juxtapose those two things as we're reading the Gospels? The specific question is, should we attempt to do everything Jesus did? Are we just like him if we are redeemed sinners? Very good question. We need to know that Jesus, again, is not a third thing. He's not this super creature um, unlike us. He's the true human. Um, so we've got to line some of these things out, but we also have to know that um, Jesus, in his, in his union of natures, divine nature and human nature, can do things that we cannot do, and that the New Testament is not fundamentally calling us to be Jesus. So sometimes you'll get that rhetoric yeah. from a pulpit, yeah. from a preacher who truly loves the Word of God and loves the Son of God, but they're, they're a little heated up, and uh, they might need a few qualifying remarks. Seminary is not about you, you know, lording your knowledge over other people. If it is that, time to drop out. But uh, it is about us, you know, being trained in the scriptures and, and, and going deeper in our understanding of the doctrines of God. And so that's going to mean that, for example, with that kind of language, you're going to think, okay, I know I need to be like Jesus, but I'm not Jesus, and that's, that's very important to, to understand. You, you, this, it sounds elementary, thinking, why, why is Strand teaching at the school with such genius insights as <laughs> I'm not Jesus and never will be? But actually, it's very important. That's right. um, because if you misunderstand the Gospels, for example, or the interpretation of the Gospels that follows in the rest of the New Testament, you're going to think, oh, well, if I have faith in the Son of God, I'll just do what he did. Move mountains. Move yeah. mountains. Yeah. Um, raise the dead. Yep. Um, heal the sick on the spot. Uh, teach the Word of God authoritatively just like him. No, 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 no. This is all following Jesus. Isn't it fascinating that in John 1, for example, Jesus walks up to future disciples and says very simply, follow me. That's all he says. And, and, and they follow him. So that's like us. Um, we, we are only able to do what regeneration grants us. And regeneration does not make us divine. It makes us saved, makes us divinely washed, but it does not make us God. That's a good word. That's a very good word. Uh, friends, we are out of time, so I want to give Dr. Strand one last opportunity here just to give us a final exhortation, both in the doctrine and, and person of Jesus, um, but then also just in your studies, perhaps it's not even through seminary, just your personal studies, how he would encourage you as, as, as we leave today. I would just say, don't let anything draw you off from marveling at the God-man, Christ Jesus, the true human, the Son of God in human flesh, the obedient servant there are going to be a lot of things that vie for your attention and your allegiance and, and your fascination. And you can enjoy the world God has made. This, this world is filled with things that God placed here for our joy and our, our happiness and, and our prospering, and we're not down on that. But we are ultimately people of Jesus. We, we are saved in the name of Jesus. We, we are Christians. We are Christians. And so we are following Jesus, and, and you and I will all feel that pull and that tug to, to get more interested in something other than the Son of God, but to be a Christian is to have the Spirit working in us such that we savor and worship Jesus on a daily basis. Nothing comes before him. Nothing is, by the way, uh, beside him. Nothing even is just under him. He has first place, and he has it by 10,000 miles in our hearts. So watch your heart, guard your heart. Don't love uh, even, this is a strong statement, but we'll close with it. Don't love even the doctrine of Christ mm -hmm. more than you love Christ. Mm -hmm. um, that may sound elementary as well, but you'd be surprised the more book learning you get, the more ministry uh, experience you get, it, it, your heart can slide. Yeah. 
in quiet and almost imperceptible ways. Make sure that it is, it is Jesus as your Savior, uh, the one whom the Father appointed, the one who the Spirit uh, leads us into knowledge of. That's great. That's great. Well, friends, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope that you will uh, consider joining us at Midwestern if you're a prospective student. Um, I oversee enrollment management at the school, so I would love to hear from you. My email is cpulliam at mbts.edu. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and if you're a current student, we're excited that you were able to, to participate in this. Mm -hmm. And if there's any way we can serve you in the days ahead, please let us know. So thank you again, and we'll see you next week.